Order your thinking. The philosopher Descartes insisted on it. Begin with the most simple objects so as to rise as if by steps to knowledge of the most complex. And so, 300 years later, you search the waters of a Scottish loch for a specimen of Nitella, a simple plant. You know already that Nitella has electrical properties akin to those of human nerves. So you subject your specimen to experiment. Where will it lead? From the evidence to reasoning, from the facts to theories, perhaps to laws. Yesterday, this was called the experimental philosophy. Now we call it science. At work here in Bombay, seeking to release energy from the infinitesimal nuclei of the atoms of a heavy metal. On Palomar Mountain, lining up a 200-inch telescope to explore the birth and death of stars. Cambridge laboratory, piecing together a picture of something no one has seen before, a molecule of the protein myoglobin. Pursuing the chemistry of life through a radioactive isotope injected into a grub. studying the dark world of the oceans, sampling its waters, examining its creatures, reasoning from the facts, checking the reasoning against new facts. Meet now a gathering of scientists, men and women who reason from the facts. Many different disciplines stand in this room. Nuclear physics, geology, zoology, biophysics, pathology, chemistry, botany, crystallography, physiology, different disciplines, a common experimental philosophy to which most of those present have made some distinguished contribution. They're assembled for a meeting of the Royal Society of London, that very famous society founded in 1660 for a very simple end, to improve the knowledge of natural things. Retrace the steps that led so far. Recall the ancient world, with us for so long, that bent its skills to superstition. The image of the cosmos contrived by medieval Europe, placing the earth firmly at the center of the universe. Recall the sudden collaborative breakthrough. The Polish monk Copernicus, confounding astrology, launching the Earth in its true orbit round the Sun. The Danish courtier Tycho Brahe, 
bringing precision to the study of the planet's motions. Revealing to Kepler, son of a woman tried for witchcraft, that their courses were ellipses. Galileo, describing the heavens through a strange instrument. Objectivity and a different humility, summed up by Isaac Newton. I seem to have been only like a boy playing by the seashore, whilst the great ocean of truth lay all undiscovered before me. Ah, here's a star now. I wonder what's that one, what's in here? Uh, proton primary, yeah, yes, and um, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine secondaries, so just about normal. And how many mesons in this, let's think? Only one. The same collaboration now. A team in Europe plots results obtained from this machine in Berkeley, California. Ready? Right. Clear all unshielded areas. Ready to accelerate beam. A few years since, Rutherford smashed the atom. Now they smash particles of atoms and discover new ones. Basically, this is a huge electromagnetic sling hurling protons against a target at almost the speed of light flinging the resulting particles into a tank of liquid hydrogen, making the disintegrating fragments reveal their path and nature. the stuff the world is made of. Seeking to pin down those strange subatomic forces glowing for a fraction of a moment, vanishing, that we don't yet understand. Francis Bacon caught the spirit of this quest. If a man could succeed, not in striking out some particular invention, but in kindling a light in nature, in ringing a bell to call other wits together, he would disclose all that is most hidden and secret in the world. The Royal Society called the wits together and does so still, to kindle in each other's company a light in nature. To a few like-minded men, a king granted their charter. They and their kind wrote a new charter for the human race. Harvey, Pasteur, Lister, issuing their challenge to distress. The curious little toy designed by Hero, set to bridge the turning earth. Priestley, Shaler, Lavoisier, releasing the infinite potential of the elements. Galvani, 
bursted. Faraday, launching revolutions wider than all the schemes of statecraft. Yet these have been the offshoots of inquiry, seldom its first concern. First now, as always, comes the assault on undiscovered truth. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, the results to be presented today represent an attempt to gain information concerning the general mechanism of cell growth and differentiation by making determinations on groups of successive segments cut from the tip of seedling pea and bean roots towards the base. This experimental approach depends upon the fact that roots possess a terminal meristem. In these three centuries, the scale of the assault has multiplied. Organized investigation breaks into the secret realms. The experimental philosophers now are governments industries, universities. Yet the cast of mind of early science governs science still. An expedition sounding the Antarctic ice cap as part of the International Geophysical Year. A lonely team preparing to sink in the Bathys Cave, six, seven, eight miles into the Mariana Trench. All accept instinctively what Newton taught. First, diligently inquire into the properties of things. Then proceed more slowly to hypotheses for the explanation of them. tools, of course, are more refined today. Huygens postulated the wave theory of light. Here, they're using the different wavelengths of light of precisely defined colors to measure length to a millionth of an inch. Nine green. Another new tool, an atomic clock tuned to the radio waves absorbed by the atoms in a beam of cesium vapor. It's accurate enough to reveal changes in the speed of the Earth's rotation. Leeuwen Hook's microscope laid bare a world never seen before. This instrument, using electrons in place of light rays, opens up another. Place a tiny flake of metal in the electron beam. Then increase the magnification and reveal the hidden flaws that warn of weakness. Contact between parallel moving minds. New aids to inquiry. These permit the ever deeper questioning of nature. Crystals of common substances. How do they grow? How 
was their strength related to the pattern of their growth? Could the strength of these tiny non-metallic crystals be preserved, developed into materials stronger than steel? If so, in what conditions? Why are leaves green? Or rather, what are the properties of this green pigment, chlorophyll? What are the hidden forces within it, provoked by sunlight to cause the interaction of carbon dioxide and water? What questions will yield definite replies? Which methods will coax them out? And when you've translated your questions into numbers, the alphabet of science, how best to work them out? How to set up your program so that the computers can sort and sift and analyze? I wonder if we've got the data. And sometimes nature gives you only enigmatic answers to be pondered, wrestled with, debated. Answers confronting us, as one physicist has put it, with a vast jumble of new numbers, an insulting lack of obvious meaning. Uh, then, uh, in one sense, it stays the same, namely its total volume is not altered. In another sense, it's, all, it's different. So, uh, are you going to say it's the same or different? You can say either way, depending on which property you want to think about. No, but, but I think it has got a point in this the following. Up to now, we have said that the system is going to be in its lowest uh, energy state because if we discuss from the probabilistic point of view, we see that if we have a background, this is the most, the mm -hmm. highest probability yes. state. I mean, you cannot discuss a thing without reference to development in time, really. Or if it is no, static, you have to you take a virtual right. development in time. No, but in what way will it be stable? You see, uh, you have no way to say this because you don't know what, what, is to be, what is ordered. It's always changing in time. It's always different. Three centuries of measuring, questioning, pattern seeking and gatherings of scientists the world over, like this great congress in the Soviet Union, pursue the ends that marked the Royal Society's first meeting in 1660. To exchange results, look ahead, plan the lines of fresh inquiry. Where do the frontiers stand today? In what fields are the most significant advances likely in the coming years? One such field affects us all. It's the investigation of the living cell, the effort to explain life in terms of chemistry. What makes us as we are? What makes us alike as a species, different as individuals? The geneticist attacks this problem why we are alike and why we are different by studying fruit flies. He's been studying them for 50 years. They breed fast. In a year or so, he can examine the equivalent of 700 years in man. He sees that peculiarities appear, making the flies different from each other. Variations in the color of the eyes, for example. Why? In every tiny cell of the fly's body are strings of chromosomes, carriers of hereditary instructions. And each peculiarity is due to some change in one of these strings. An irregularity here and a bar eye results. Life maintains itself by cell division. Thousands of cells in your own body are dividing like this now. And the chromosomes of the parent cell divide also, passing to each daughter cell an exact copy of the hereditary instructions. But how? The chemist takes a mass of living cells from a freshly killed rat. He separates out in the centrifuge 
the material within the chromosomes that carries the hereditary instructions. This is it, the stuff that somehow governs what we are. What's it made of? Fundamental chemical research revealed phosphate groups and four compounds, nucleosides, made up of bases combined with a rare sugar, deoxyribose. So they called the substance, this stuff that determines life, deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA. The chemist sees it as a chain of different groups of atoms. But under the most powerful electron microscope, the molecule is seen only as a mere thread. How can we get closer, find out how the chains of atoms are arranged along the thread-like molecule? They puzzled out a chemical sketch, sugar and phosphate atoms along the backbone, the four compounds forming side links. But a sketch on paper is one thing. What does it look like in reality? Here, the physicist can help. He draws the DNA into a fiber. As it lengthens, so the thread-like molecules align themselves in a regular pattern that allows him to use his most powerful tool, X-ray crystallography. His method is to make the fine atomic structure of the DNA reveal its shape by scattering the even finer X-rays. He plays the X-ray beam on the DNA for four to six weeks, makes it break up the beam to reveal on a photographic plate an image which he can mathematically relate to the atomic structure of the molecule. And so, by intricate calculation and a brilliant guess, we get a model of something no one has ever seen of the giant molecule of DNA. And we find in this enormous complexity not one chain of atoms, but two. Two chains with up to 30,000 atomic links coiled around each other, suggesting a template mechanism of reproduction. We know now that it's the different order of arrangement of the atoms along these chains that spells out the code dictating the character of life, man or mouse, you or me. As the chains unwind, as the chromosomes part, as the cells divide to make a new living creature. Why are we as we are? The questions Darwin and Mendel first posed, we are beginning to answer precisely. One day, who knows, we may break the hereditary code itself. Would you just check that PGR electrode? There's enough slack on the wires, though. Just tug that a little bit, would you? It seems to be a bit awkward. Investigating the most complex organic pattern known, the 10,000 million nerve cells that make up the human brain. How do we learn? The zoologist studies the learning process by experimenting with an octopus. This octopus is learning that if it goes for the crab when a white disc is showing, it gets an electric shock.
it learns to recognize the disc as dangerous and hold back. Where does this learning come from? Remove a certain lobe of the brain. And try again. The lesson is forgotten. In this lobe then lies the seat of memory. Your leg's quite comfortable. Yes. Thanks very much. Yes. <clears throat> when this girl's mind learns to associate a light with an unpleasant noise, she'll be able to stop the noise. The minute electric currents set up as her brain learns will be picked up by electrodes on the surface of the skull and recorded. The brain at work, grappling with a problem, striving to learn. first steps towards fuller comprehension of our memory, experience, consciousness. Another field of present concentration is the deeper exploration of the heavens. Areas of crashing turmoil in the seeming calm of the sky. Picked up by the radio telescope at Jodrell Bank as it probes towards the limits of the universe. Scan 30. Declination 31 degrees 25 minutes. Right ascension 20 hours 50 minutes. Intensity, 28.1. Hundreds upon hundreds of radio sources. What are they? Exploded stars? Writhing gas clouds? Galaxies that collided before the dinosaurs evolved? Slowly, the blanks in the map of space are beginning to be filled. And now the technologist is arming the science of the heavens with a new tool of exploration, the instrument carrying satellite, the electronic telescope located in space itself. Three hundred years of labor, intuition, patience. 
of anxiety, disappointment, triumph, humility in face of facts. And what has now been found and proved and built on only reveals how great is still the ocean of undiscovered truth. How urgent still to kindle a light in nature, to disclose all that remains hidden and secret in the universe.